uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon for this uh, very interesting session on um, this COVID-19 impact on real estate. Uh, and today we're very happy to have our alumni, especially young alumni, uh, back to uh, this uh, uh, Zoom session. Uh, so we have uh, five uh, speakers today. Uh, before that, let me introduce myself. I'm going to be a uh, um, moderator today, uh, and I'm, I'm an associate professor at the Department of Real Estate. My name is Kwanok Lee, and I'm a deputy head of the uh, Department of Real Estate too. So today we are very happy to uh, bring these uh, five distinguished alumni back to uh, our uh, department uh, uh, seminar. Um, and uh, let me introduce one by one. So first we have uh, Lucas Wong. Uh, who is uh, at uh, Tamasic. Uh, he's an associate director and investment team. Um, he uh, joined the Tamasic in uh, 2018 uh, as a part of the real estate investment team and he's uh, currently associate director uh, at Tamasic. Uh, next we have Jacob To, um, who is a senior manager at our uh, fund management team in uh, Prologis. Uh, he has uh, six years, around six years experience in real estate investment. And uh, prior to joining uh, Prologis in 2017, he was a manager in the Freiburg Funds uh, depart uh, Department of uh, Capital Lands Group. Um, next, we have John Paul Tra. Uh, he uh, joined Maple Tree in 2014. Uh, as the firm's new markets team responsible for its expansion into Australia, Europe, and the U.S. He's currently in the U.S. and joining us at like 4 a.m. from uh, U.S. time. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, John to join us at a very um, early in the morning in his time. Uh, next, we have Karis Tan. Uh, she joined Shell. Uh, as a part of the Shell Graduate Program. Uh, she has uh, two ex years experience in uh, portfolio planning, asset and lease management, and master plan activities for the APEC region. So she is currently real estate portfolio advisor at Shell. Uh, finally, we have Lo Yi Min, uh, who is an analyst and uh, SC Capital. She uh, uh, is an anal analyst with a portfolio management team at uh, SC capital partners and is involved in various asset management value enhancement and uh, realization activities. Um, so she um, is also uh, the uh, alumni and double degree holder uh, with this uh, Bachelor in Real Estate and Business Administration uh, from mm -hmm. NUS. So all of these uh, five alumni were very good students. I remember all of them. Um, uh, because they were very good students uh, uh, in the uh, university days. And then now we very uh, excited to hear how they uh, sort of cope with this COVID-19 uh, challenges and then how uh, these young alumni have uh, sort of uh, uh, any uh, suggestions uh, for uh, the our real estate curriculum and you know the future in the real estate and you know if they have any comments on their uh, juniors uh, at the uh, uh, department of real estate so a lot of things uh, will be interesting uh, uh, talk um, so we'll start the uh, speakers uh, presentation uh, starting from Lucas uh, thanks Prof Lee uh, okay so before I start maybe I will first caveat that uh for myself and probably the four other panelists today. Uh, this is probably, the COVID-19 is probably the first crisis that we face. So there's a lot of learning in place. There's a lot of listening to experiences of people from, uh, uh, from people who have basically seen a lot more things. Uh, I myself, we have picked up quite a lot of uh, valuable insights from uh, some of the previous lectures. So thanks to the organizers who put together this series and to the viewers, thanks for taking your time to listen. So one of our observations over the last few months is that we have been forcing ourselves to embrace technology while working from home. Uh, we've been working from home since as early as March, and I would say that most of us have yet to return to office today. So maybe what would be really useful for us would be to focus on this particular series uh, on work from home and its uh, potential impact on commercial real estate. Uh, some of the things that we've been hearing and observing in recent months, uh, speaking to various stakeholders in the real estate industry. Uh, before that, maybe an additional introduction to what I'm currently doing. So I'm in Tamasic Real Estate for close to about two and a half years. 
And as a firm, we are active investors seeking long-term sustainable value. So from a real estate perspective, we are always looking out for investment opportunities across cycles into various trend pillars, uh, connectivity, rising affluence in developing markets, digitalization, et cetera. So today, a large part of our portfolio includes uh, the major Singapore companies that you are familiar with, Capital Land, Maple Tree, Capital, Sabana Jurong. And we also have other direct investment across a wide mandate uh, in hard assets, platforms, as well as early stage ventures and real estate services company and so forth. So with that, uh, let's start on the topic and talk about crystal balling the real estate industry with some future thinking. Right. So future thinking basically ignores whatever, say, near-term displacement or concerns or struggles that the industry faces in the near term, uh, be it drop in rents or occupancy from, say, a lockdown measure or, or even cash collection troubles with tenants. Uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, future thinking will be to ask ourselves, uh, how would the real estate industry look like 10 years from now for the next decade? What we are sure of is that this pandemic definitely exposes some of the weaknesses we have in the real estate industry, uh, e-commerce being one of, the, one of them that we are very familiar with, so I will not dwell too much into it. So in parallel, we have the work from home trend, which is a bit more of a, at a nascent stage, and particularly investors and corporates are now paying quite a lot of attention to the long-term impact of uh, work from home on uh, office uh, operations as well as valuation. So we noticed some of the headlines that really caught our attention in the last few months, uh, including Twitter, which basically said that employees could now work remotely forever if they want to, and if their position allows for it. And it's not just tech companies. So Barclays, the bank, also commented on their own office use, uh, usage that the notion of putting about 7,000 people in the same building may be a thing in the past. Uh, closer to home, uh, Fujitsu, the Japanese company, announced a couple of weeks ago that they are exploring permanent work from home for about 80,000 employees and also to cut office space by about 50% in 2022. So we see that some of these investors are already pricing in some of the concerns into the public read market. Uh, at one point in the US, which I'm covering, so office reads are trading at close to the same discount to valuation as uh, retail reads and hospitality reads, which basically are the primary victims in this pandemic. Uh, so the concern is uh, whether this fear is real or are people too affected by this sensational news like a Twitter saying uh, about permanent working from home? Uh, we do not know at this point. And apart from some surveys being done, I think the reality is that there are very little facts and data to support any conclusion at all. So we need to do some future thinking, uh, scenario planning, uh, coming, coming out with some hypotheses that we can track along the way and test it out with observations. So to summarize what we have been hearing in this industry, uh, there are about four trends that affect the future of office. The first one being that uh, working from home is now a lot more acceptable. Uh, before COVID in the US, about 4% of the total workforce regularly worked from home. I think post COVID this will increase, but uh, to what number, right? To address this, I think we need to overcome two barriers. The first barrier being a technology barrier whereby it was previously one, uh, it was previously a barrier, but I would feel that it is already broken in 2020. So when COVID happened, I think most firms, whether they like it or not, uh, from a business continuity standpoint, uh, they, have to, they were being forced to basically put most, or if not 100% of their employees at home, and at the same time to build technology infrastructure in place. And I would say that at this point, most were successful in doing that. Whereas the second barrier, which is a bit more tricky, is the adoption barrier, which is a mindset change whereby you actually allow your employees to work from home on a more regular basis. Uh, question would be, how do you measure worker productivity and ensure that your business gets going without, like, say, employees feeling like uh, uh, demotivated or uh, working with low morale. And also, how do you like ensure that your business gets going uh, without seeing your employees uh, for a long period of time? So this period, I think, uh, what will be really important is to measure, to be able to measure uh, motivation, to be able to measure productivity across this period, and how do and think about how do we continue to instill the right corporate values into your employees, and if this is successful, uh, adoption barrier would definitely reduce in the next few years, and work from home would definitely become a, a lot more acceptable. Uh, moving on to the second trend, uh, it is about rethinking about the concept of a corporate headquarter. Uh, which is actually a derivative of trend one if we uh, increasing work from home. So space and utilization will definitely change in the long run to account for more fluid use of uh, office space. There'll be more shared purpose spaces, meeting rooms, uh, maybe more training schools or other collaborative ventures in place. Then maybe on the other hand, lesser space required for desk 
to do individual work, which can be done, say, in your home office. In terms of the macro impact, decentralization will definitely continue to go up. Uh, corporates may choose to have more site offices closest, uh, closer to employees' home versus like a corporate HQ. Uh, densification will go down, right, with a safe distancing measure likely to continue staying. Uh, more space per employee is required. The last one is also digitalization, whereby tech is the great enabler for remote work and hence promoting a new form of office space. Third trend, uh, flexible space, is something that definitely exists pre-COVID. Uh, it's not a new business model, but we see that there's an increasing take up in or importance post-COVID. Uh, this model basically exists because it addresses a need or a gap in the existing office leasing environment, right? Whereby leasing of space today no longer needs to be confined within the physical barrier of having four walls within a space. Uh, we now have the ability to track space usage on a per table, per meeting room, per hour basis. Uh, and we can, do the, uh, we can do that easily, which is more difficult uh, compared to like say five or 10 years ago. And this will let, allow landlords or operator to increasingly able to match the demand for space as a result of this shift of uh, moving towards more flexibility in new working arrangement. And the last trend, the last trend that I'll talk about is the hotelization of real estate, whereby the concept of uh, space as a service Right. Uh, it's not no longer just a lingo for real estate company, but the way moving forward. Uh, there's a need for basically landlords to now better engage the end users. And the end users are not the tenants who are signing the leases, but rather the, the, we have to go one level down in terms of user engagement to directly deal with the employees itself. TechCrunch basically has an article a few days ago called uh, the, future of work is, the Future of Work is Human. Uh, in which they talk about a more human-centric uh, workplace design. And I think this is spot on, right? Uh, office space needs to be redesigned with the employees in mind, and this will require capex and money, right? Landlords will face the challenge of having to reposition or redevelop their assets more frequently to keep up with the ever-changing demand needs uh, from uh, employees. And that's the fourth trend. So now that I've covered the four trends, uh, we also need to acknowledge that there may be a scenario whereby we all go back to normal because uh, we should not underestimate the ability for people to basically forget stuff, right? Uh, but at this point, I'll say that it's difficult to predict what will happen to the commercial real estate industry. Uh, and the answers may vary from different perspectives, from different people with different uh, things at stake, right? But as an investor, I think it's important to also acknowledge and more importantly, respect these uh, forces that are in place today, uh, which will potentially have a long-term impact on value creation and uh, returns when we look at our existing portfolio and new investments. And um, what is undeniable, of course, is, and this is more of a personal experience, is that uh, how easily it is for our norm to be challenged. Uh, the way that we live our lives in 2019, uh, that we probably took for granted, seems like a distant memory today. And they say change is the only constant, right? So, so this decade, I think there'll be a lot more changes and COVID may just be a tip of the iceberg. Looking at what's happening in US, in China, in Hong Kong, um, tensions are arising, right? The changes will come fast and uh, it may be drastic in nature as well. And uh, if there's one takeaway over my last five years of, uh, of, being, of working, uh, I think that there's increasing value in business models that are asset like. So because they have this structural superiority in terms of having less baggage that will drag you down when uh, the environment basically forces you to change your business model. And perhaps this speaks for people as well, right? Uh, the best people are the, always the ones that are most agile and uh, most nimble. Um, and same for us, I think uh, moving forward, we have to be open-minded to changes, be adaptable and uh, learn fast. And with that, I think I'll pass my time to the other speakers. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, over to you, Prof Lee. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Jacob Cho, uh, who is going to talk about his uh, own uh, challenges and uh, experiences, how to cope with the uh, COVID-19. Thanks, Prof Lee. Thanks, Lucas. I thought the presentation was very useful, insightful. Um, I think as a start, it's an honor to share the stage with familiar faces and friends, juniors who I've known. So humble to share my two cents worth with you guys today. So as a quick background, basically I, I moved to Prologis and I'm based in Singapore two years ago. So I focus on logistics investments and farm management 
in China specifically. Previously, I was with Capital Land and Capital Land, and I covered uh, investments and fund management across APEC markets. So the, the focus of my webinar session today is mainly to focus on the challenges and also the opportunities that we see. I think this is a very challenging and interesting time we are living in, and more so from the fact that we are doing this presentation via a Zoom rather than back in SDE. Certainly in the middle of a pandemic, that's impacted all facets of our lives, causing major disruption to economies, social life, businesses. We also confront geopolitical challenges, including a potential tech cold war, China and US tensions, and rise of populism. And that, together with one of the worst recession ever known, among many things. I think, well, it might seem tough to be optimistic among all the negative headlines we are seeing and feeling on the ground. Each matter that we face always has two faces to it. So rather than focusing on the negatives, I think we should also evaluate each purely as an opportunity, as a, as a challenge. So I think in a pandemic and post-pandemic world, what's going to happen is we have basically fast-tracked our life by potentially a decade, according to many experts. What seems difficult to imagine pre-pandemic which is a work from home culture whereby uh, telecommunication is the norm rather than the outlier. COVID-19 has actually given us a push behind our back. Video conferencing, online shopping, limited face-to-face -face gatherings are just now part and parcel of our lives. And this propelled on by development in tech-enabled living, which just means that our lives will drastically change and which moves on to my next point, which is change. I think, uh, like what Lucas mentioned, we need to be comfortable with change. Change is uncomfortable because it takes, away, takes us away from our comfort zone. And, but change is necessary, especially in times like this, because it redefines what is possible and what is not possible. I think the more comfortable we get with the concept of change, the more resilience we actually build in ourselves. And speaking of change, this actually moves on to my next point, which is redefining real estate. So this is a huge game changer in terms of how we see, how we understand, and how we utilize real estate. Let's say uh, office space, for example. So prior to COVID-19, prior to the onset of this pandemic, what we see are actually a rise and rise of huge grade A office spaces and uh, permanent leases. But now with with this COVID-19, with a work from home culture, what we are seeing is actually uh, a lot of people working from home. We actually see surprisingly a rise in co-working trends. I was just looking at the SoftBank uh, quarterly results recently. And what they've analyzed by their investment in WeWork is that during this pandemic, they actually see more people signing up for short-term leases, a more flexible kind of lease structures compared to what tradition in the past is a permanent lease with a great A, great office space. Um, there'll be a fall in permanent headquarters. I think uh, there will still be headquarters, but potentially the amount of space required for such uh, purposes might decrease. For retail spaces, I think the consumption of retail spaces have been undergoing drastic changes for quite a while. And this COVID-19 basically has uh, accelerated that change. I think uh, rather than traditionally what, what has been purely a brick and mortar space whereby uh, fashion, retail outlets set up shops to showcase their products, uh, the, the space requirement from this, this type of tenants might actually decrease. So increasingly what retail malls might look like in future will be more of activity spaces. In fact, there might even be a mix of users within a retail space itself. Say, for example, in the US, we actually see small offices, small childcare centers set up shop within a traditional retail space itself. So I think these are changes that we foresee will actually happen uh, in the long run. And I think, of course, uh, my favorite topic, logistics. I think the rise of e-commerce the rise of trend in terms of people consuming products via an interface, which is the internet, rather than face-to-face, -face, actually is beneficial 
to the logistics space. So instead of retailers setting up shops in a retail mall to house their merchandise and sell their products, they actually might potentially use retail spaces to showcase to people who might want to have a feel of the product, but who might not actually consume the product within the retail space, but consume it off online. And that actually benefits logistics space, which to most people is actually a place to store their infantry and to keep track of their orders. So I think what's next? I think quite often we focus on the negatives, but we also forget that, especially for the batch of graduates after us, um, they grew up together with the rise of internet, with technology. I think they have seen, they have used various adaptions, adoptions of technology in their lives. And I think one of the, the great trait that they actually might potentially possess over, over the rest of us is actually the fact that they would potentially be less fearful of the rise of tech and be more adaptable to changes driven by it. So I think it's, it's easy to focus on negatives, but again, like what I've uh, mentioned previously, I think to each issue, there's an opportunity and there's also a challenge. And it's really fundamentally how we approach the subject at the end of the day. Thank you. I think that's the end of my presentation. And I'll pass on to Prof Lee. Well, thank you so much, Jacob, uh, uh, for giving us a hope uh, in addition to some negative uh, uh, aspects and that we worried so much about uh, uh, during this pandemic period. Uh, next, we'll have uh, John Paul Chua from New York. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, thank you, Jacob. I think it's a really interesting slide. Uh, like Jacob mentioned earlier, I'm happy to see familiar faces to start off. Uh, I will start with a caveat at first, saying that uh, it's 3 a.m. here in New York, so forgive me if I go off tangent and start talking shit. A little background about me, uh, I graduated from NUS uh, real estate in 2014 and joined the Maple Tree New Markets team as an analyst, so started my coverage with Australia, Japan, and Hong Kong uh, before moving on to the group and US. And then fast forward today, I relocated in, uh, uh, to New York uh, late last year. Not the most perfect timing, <laughs> as I spent the last uh, three months actually hold up in my apartment. Uh, New York has been badly hit by the pandemic, as you can imagine. Uh, the size of New York City itself is, is, is approximately the same size of, uh, as Singapore, but it has actually five times more ca uh, cases. I think I, I last checked, it was about 227, 280,000 cases. Yeah. So, uh, so actually it's quite, uh, I, I feel quite fortunate as a Singaporean that, I mean, I think we are still handling our case loads quite well. So one, I think, particular incident that actually hit quite close to heart was uh, during this pandemic, uh, an American friend of ours actually got COVID-19 after attending one of the realistic conferences. I think it was a realistic conference that I was supposed to attend as well. Uh, but could not uh, due to some last minute uh, scheduling changes. Uh, but what happened after that uh, actually was the scary part. Uh, as he was younger, he was, I mean, he's, he's about 25, he wasn't actually allowed to be admitted to hospital despite testing positive and having a mild case of pneumonia, as they wanted to ration big space for the more vulnerable population. Uh, you must imagine being quite new to the country, it's actually daunting experience, even, you know, unfamiliarity with healthcare and support systems. Uh, and it was, it's during many times like this, you appreciate the quality of life you had in Singapore really before. You know, just to share a bit about my experience here in the US, uh, uh, thankfully, I think it's gradually uh, returning to normalcy in New York. Uh, the city is in phase four reopening and shops are reopening and public spaces are reopening. I think the only real restriction that we are having is uh, indoor dining. So it's, while well, it's unfortunate for a foodie like me, uh, I think it could be much worse. Yeah. So I think in the interest of time, I just want to share a little bit more about like, you know, one opportunity and one threat that I think we as young alumni will face uh, as we chart our career over the next five to 10 years. Uh, 
So uh, I think the first opportunity I would talk about is uh, was the mega trends, uh, similar to what Lucas and Jacob have shared uh, earlier on the long term effects of work from home in the office sector. I think it's a trend that we, uh, as made, uh, you know, as real estate professionals, are uh, watching closely as well. Uh, so, um, some evidence of, of this trend uh, happening in, in New York, uh, Citibank actually entered into a, a sublease in New Jersey because I think they, they felt that, you know, it's not safe to go back to Manhattan at the moment. So, you, you see people try to de-densify Really. But you know, I'm a strong believer of uh, real estate. I'm a strong believer of cities. Uh, I don't think that this trend will last for long. I may regret my words today, but uh, you know, if we just look back a little bit, uh, you know, three, even six months uh, back, uh, you know, you see tech companies uh, moving out from the campuses in you know California to cities like New York to cities like London, and the main reason why they actually you know. Uh, do that, you know, it's, it's basically for a war for talent, right? So everyone is looking to hire the best talent and and this firms actually realize that, you know, despite the perks of, you know, having a campus style uh, headquarters, you know, in, 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 a, in, in a suburban area in California, uh, the talent do not want to, you know, relocate from, from their lives uh, there and that's why they decide to go towards the talent. talent. Uh, and, 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 and I feel that, you know, once the pandemic dies down, uh, you know, young, you know, young professionals like us who want to go back to the city, you know, who want to, to enjoy the, the lifestyle, the urban environment, the nightlife even, yeah. So I, I think, I, I, I think we shall wait and see, but I think, uh, I, I, I foresee a trend where we, uh, we will return to normal. Uh, so I, I think I, I just want to, you know, look back because I think uh, Lucas brought out a good point about, you know, future thinking. So uh, just wanted to look back into history to actually somehow try to forecast the future. Uh, you know, thinking about real estate in 10 years cycles and COVID-19 uh, on real estate as a whole. I think what we are observing today is really not a structural shift uh, in terms of uh, real estate, but an acceleration of things that were already happening, uh, you know, pre-COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic has demonstrated, you know, the importance of the digital economy and e-commerce and real estate that fuels this economy. You say, take for example, logistics. We, we don't have to look really very far back. Uh, back in 2010, actually, when I was still in school, uh, it was considered the ugly duckling of the real estate sector because of its low returns. Uh, so much so that many actually institutional fund managers can actually propose relocating capital away to the more profitable sectors, uh, you know, like hospitality. So you can see that that, that is some of the 15, 20 year leases that uh, were signed back then. You know, blue chip users like FedEx have a 2.5% step up every five years. And this is in, in the US where, you know, any escalation is actually very common. Uh, you look at the office, any office lease, you, it probably states that, you know, there's a 2% step up year on year. Uh, the rise of e-commerce has actually disrupted this entire scene. Today, uh, when you look at research uh, from the likes of Amazon, they are coming in with your built-in 2.5% annual acceleration. So your, your whole return profile fundamentally changes as an investor. If you buy in at a 5 cap, your total improvement your total return improves actually from a five and a half handle to a seven and a half handle. You know, that's an easily two hundred basis points improvement. So I think COVID nineteen will give rise to new investable asset classes as uh, more capital review their strategies to take advantage of this digital economy. Uh, so you know, if I'm graduating in the next few years, I'll be looking for opportunities to take advantage of this shift in allocations uh, to understand what what investors are thinking, we, I think we have to really take reference from the public real estate market. Uh, REITs as a whole in the US are down 15 to 80% uh, year to date. But I mean, if you, if you look, if you dive deeper into this data, we can see that, you know, investors are clearly incorporating some of the early thinking about
about a post-COVID uh, economy, uh, what it will look like and how it might impact real estate. All the major sectors like office and apartments are down 20% and hotels and malls are even worse, they are like washed out. But uh, there are sectors that are actually up. You will see the usual suspects like industrial uh, is up 2.5%. But more excitingly, you know, there's this space that I think we, 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 are, we are talking a lot uh, about a lot of these days. I think there's data centers. Data center rates are actually up 20% post pandemic. Yeah. So they are doing better than ever before. And so I think one thesis to look at regarding the post virus economy and real estate landscape is to argue that COVID 19 is going to accelerate this evolution into our digital economy. Therefore, you know, your data centers, cell towers, Wi-Fi routers, anything 5G uh, will be invoked for at least next five years. Uh, once again, I, I, I think just to share, it's, it's really not a new trend since uh, because in 2016, traffic has already increased 25% year on year. So digital real estate fulfilling the needs of a digital economy is just like how warehouses are fulfilling the needs of e-commerce. And my take on it is to actually keep out, uh, keep a close eye out on opportunities in that space. And I think I'll, I'll move on to the more somber trend that I see coming, uh, which I feel that is a is a trend that will affect us uh, as real estate professionals in Singapore. Uh, you no, know, I think real estate professionals in Singapore, such as uh, you know myself, have benefited a lot from you know being a financial hub, at ease of uh, you know the ease of access to capital, tax advantages, high standard of living. Uh, you see a lot of Pan-Asian, pan Southeast Asian fund managers being based out of Singapore. So I think looking at that, when COVID-19 first hit, one of the things that you know, I observed was you know, the restriction of movement. Uh, on the more international level, you see travel bans, travel restrictions, imposed quarantines. Even today, if I were to return to Singapore, I, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, uh, probably you being in Korea, you know, you, you'll be hit by a stay home notice. Uh, in New York, it's even worse because they are actually imposing 14 day quality orders for, you know, American states. So 31 or 50 states actually uh, are under this uh, 14 day quarantine orders. So if I were to travel to California today and I come back to New York, I would have to stay at home for 14 days minimally. So even in the same country, local travel is actually being restricted quite heavily. Uh, and I think that is disrupting real estate operations at a very fundamental level, because when we are going to buyers interviews, the first thing the potential seller will be asking is that given that you're a foreign buyer, how certain are you able to complete this transaction? Do members of your investment community need to travel to see the building before we need to sign any binding documents? Uh, and I think these are very valid questions. Uh, and worries and concerns that you know sellers have in this in this current situation, and while I don't think there is a strong bias towards foreign buyers at the moment, but you know as people fail to close, I'm not sure if this will be a lasting stigma. So yeah, I think this is something that we should look at uh, uh, like quite carefully about. You know, there's increasing talks of you know getting local guys to do inspections to do DVs. Uh, even in the US, people are saying that they can only do DD or duties within the six to eight hour driving range because you know it's just not too safe to take airplanes anymore. So the nature of real estate being very physical has the trappings of a very highly localized business. And this pandemic actually brought about a localization trend. And I think it's a Pandora's box that you know will be hard to put back once you uh once uh once we move towards this direction. You no, know, once you once you develop onshore competencies, uh, I I would think it would be very difficult for us as uh, you know uh, young Singaporean real estate professionals to try to cover other markets as well. So I think in the medium to long term, the challenge or question uh, is that is the Singapore real estate market deep enough to support you know that many professionals that we are training out every year, and you know people that aspire to go into like private equity acquisitions as a management goes, how can we maintain a competitive age? Yeah. So I think some thoughts. Uh, thank you, Puffy. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you so much, John. Um, so yeah, very interesting uh, that a lot of uh, challenges that we are currently experiencing was existing even before COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, the COVID-19 actually accelerates a lot of things, you know, like, uh, you know, this digital economy and, you know, some localization trends and all these kind of things. And, you know, it's a big question for us how to sort of uh, cope with this. So let's move to Karis Tan's presentation. Hi everyone, uh, just really happy to come here and just share a bit of uh, perspective of how has COVID really impacted um, on Shell side or more of like the corporate real estate side. Like. So I think one of the reasons why I'm in, the call, in this call today is because, you know, I've made the plunge to like, you know, took the, the plunge to basically join co corporate real estate. It's not a typical like career choice. So corporate real estate was like, you know, like throughout my four years in the US, no one really thought much of it a lot about it everybody was talking about like oh you should join like a developer firm or like a fund manager firm a management firm or you should join like the service consultancies but no one really thought about like what like corporate real estate is so for me uh i just went in also blind as well and then you know a couple of profs here in the call today were basically the reason why i joined corporate real estate like they said that you know you if i throw you into the deep end you know you'll just swim out of it and two years later i'm still swimming so uh, got to say, I enjoyed quite a bit. So I think today's call will basically just uh, help you guys think in terms of like um, the perspective of a tenant or a occupier. What has COVID or how has COVID really impacted, you know, the way we plan our portfolio moving ahead. So I'm going to give you more perspective of that. And uh, just now, you know, uh, Lucas, John, Jacob all mentioned uh, a lot about, you know, uh, the, re the new realities now affecting like offices about how everybody is like gravitating towards working from home because purely there's a no choice decision everybody is just forced on the lockdown basis to work from home and then from you know an occupier or tenant perspective it's a major operation to get like for example shell has about ninety thousand employees globally it's a major operation to suddenly you know just get an office everything in the office to kind of like fit in someone's home and it's like, you know, for, for locations that people can't afford to have like a uh, home office, it's talking about getting like huge IT equipment and ergonomic budget to make that possible. And then also, you know, um, that was the initial phase. So everybody is like reacting because uh, like all rightfully say that, you know, COVID is something that we have never seen on a global scale before or even a regional scale. And it's something that, you know, we have to play by ear. So once things happen, you just think what's the next step, what's the next step, and then all the way to today and glad that everything is still working well at the company is functioning uh, as, as usual. So now I think more of like the next steps of what is coming ahead, right? It's like now that everybody is good working from home, it's everybody's productive, there's enough sufficient IT tools to allow you to have like productive meetings or, you know, just uh, do your regular office job. But then at the same time, like, you know, moving forward when, when you know, it's safer to go to office. So now there's a stage. They, they, there are three phases for the whole COVID timeline. So first will be uh, business continuity. How do you allow um, people to work in this whole, like, circuit breaker period? And then suddenly, uh, as, you know, as we transition more into, like, a return to office space, so that's when, you know, how do we prepare our offices with the right social distancing measure or, you know, regulatory, like, requirements that we have to adhere to? How do we get our office back to, like, uh, somewhat 50% capacity or lesser? Uh, because the default working is still working from home. Or, you know, for the industrial sites that we have, you know, um, sites like uh, the refinery plants have to run on, like, a 24-hour basis, 24-7 basis. So how do we, like, prioritize, like, oh, essential workers, they are safe, and then those that are not so essential but have to be on site, you know, those are, you know, safe, secure, and they feel comfortable enough to go to the go back to office. And you have those who are permanently working from home. How do you ensure that they are equally productive or they still feel connected to the company? So these are a lot of things that, you know, as a workplace professional or RE, as an occupier site, you have to consider. And you have to just get the gears into motion and ensure that, you know, at the end of the day, workplace, whether it's at home or whether it's the office or the physical space itself, you know, it serves its purpose of, you know, allowing people to, you know, contribute to, back to the company and, and be able to work as efficient as possible. So I think a lot of what uh, all the other speakers mentioned, um, they, they are, you know, uh, things that we think about, like, you know, our strategy planning, they are all, you know, we can do so many strategies, so many papers, like, you know, will people come back, will people not, we're going to do surveys, we're going to do this. At the end of the day, we can't tell until, like, you know, a vaccine is found, 
and then you can't tell if I mean whatever survey you do if people are not going back to office that's the truth and we have to live with it so like right now like after people are returning gradually right because now people are returning with a very cautious mindset meaning that you know they this COVID is still at the back of people's mind there are people who are voluntarily not going back because they feel not safe to do so but then once there's this new normal thing happening like going to happen where a vaccine is found and or uh, you know, COVID is no longer at the back of people's minds. So how does the new office, you know, utilization wise going to look like? Are people going to voluntarily, you know, go back to office like as, as though nothing's going to happen or like forget like what Lucas said that people tend to do? Or are people going to say like, you know, guess what? Like working from home is so much freedom. There's so much, you know, uh, uh, time on your hands. Like, is that something that people want that office becomes like irrelevant? So this uh, a bit of like, you know, uh, from my end, from the strategy kind of portfolio angle, I have to consider. And basically, as things go by along that whole timeline, the whole COVID timeline, we have to react accordingly and know um, locally what is it that people want and people would opt for, and then to know exactly how we're going to uh, adjust our portfolio. So that's a bit of like a precursor or to just to uh, uh, comment a bit on, on what the others have mentioned. So I think on my end, I'll just go run through a little bit about the, the business that I'm in and how does that, uh, how does COVID affect the business and thereby affecting real estate? Because if you look at real estate from an occupier angle, uh, it is a derived demand. It has to do with how much the business requires. So here, uh, just a very simplified um, 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 diagram. What you can see is that um, for Shell, we, we, we do manage all the way from upstream to downstream, meaning you get the oil from the ground or from deep sea, and all the way when you refine it, you distill it, you know what you learn in, in, in secondary school. And then um, you distill it into the various products and it goes um, all the way to the, the packaging and then consumers and you, know, you ship to different uh, uh, consumers globally. And then we are also really big on biofuels and renewable energy. So we are into solar, we are into uh, hydrogen powered vehicle, EVs and, and biofuels. So this is a bit on um, the, the business lens, uh, business profile of Shell. What happened in the real estate uh, division is that uh, globally we manage uh, 20 uh, billion USD asset value uh, in terms of the real estate portfolio value and we manage about 90,000 employees globally. So um, just to give you a flavor of what kind of building we manage in Shell, uh, majority will be a corporate office, meaning that you know, for those knowledge workers with uh, primarily in commercial functions, trading functions, sales, these are the people who just you know, uh, get by, uh, uh, can, can do their job using a regular laptop. So these are the ones that, you know, our corporate office are the ones that are mostly affected by the whole work from home um, situation where you know everybody can like get out of the site except those who need specialized like equipment like if I'm not wrong the exploration team has like certain software that they only can or and hardware they can only use in office but the rest of the workers essentially like like me I can work from home on a day-to-day -day basis so on that like suddenly you have huge part of your portfolio right suddenly empty because like you know it's just you your list is tied in and most uh leases as, as the other speakers have briefly uh, mentioned it's like you know they are all very traditional grade a like three to five years there's not a lot of flexibility in terms of allowing you to pre-terminate early or you know uh, let out your space it's all like on a negotiation basis so as a result huge amount of portfolio is just waiting there like unused and we are just looking at what the new normal is and basically make a decision a then or slightly before then to to ensure that you know, as a real estate function, we are being smart with our money. We are, we are ensuring that, you know, at the end of the day, we're paying for what we use. Yeah, so that's corporate office. And we also have tech centers and labs, which are basically in the R&D space. So, for example, your, your, uh, what you know in, like, the petrol station, the V-Power, the Helix, um, F1 fuel, uh, these are labs. So, when it comes to labs, it's not that affected by COVID. It will be purely on a cash basis, meaning that on a business side, um, if there's any decision, decisions on lab, that will affect whether that lab remains or the lab goes, or is there, if there's any capex related to the lab itself. And then similarly with uh, all the industrial kind of assets, so we have the refineries, the chemical plants, the loop oil blending plants. So these are a bit of mix of everything. So basically like 
uh, for example, we have a refinery plant in um, Island, uh, in between Jurong Island and Sentosa. So what does refinery island need to have, right? For example, a refinery just has like a lot of tanks and, and pipes connecting all of them. Besides this, you need offices to house employees, you need purpose-built building like accommodation, you need your own fire, police, uh, cleaning, warehouse, workshop. Like this is just a majority of, of what constitutes in the plant. So within the plant and plant itself or more industrial assets, what happens is that uh, when it comes to COVID, um, you, you need the plant to operate on a 24-7 basis. So then you have to segregate your, your employees accordingly to what is required. First, uh, prioritize a crew that ensures that the, run, the, the plant's running well. And then after that, prioritizing the, the others on a need-to-need -need basis. And then ramping up slowly as you know uh, the whole COVID situation gets better, then you can have more people on the plant itself. So this is a bit tricky when it comes to FM because there's a lot of things that you have to do, meaning that like from the the the, the start when you come into the, the refinery, you need to make sure that's proper queuing. And then when it comes to canteen operation, what do you do? So suddenly, you know, as a, a, a site manager or like some of what my colleagues do is like they have to think on an end-to-end -end perspective. Like suddenly they're managing retail, they're managing office, they're managing like so many parts of the uh, real estate all in one. So it's, it's quite chaotic at first, but after a while, you know, with, with all the regulations coming in and all the, the guidelines globally, uh, the, it becomes more clear and, and yeah, uh, things can go on uh, in this kind of new reality. So, and then some of the other uh, assets we have are, are as below. Lah. And we also have a few offices in kind of like co-working and uh, office. So for example, for smaller sites and uh, for transient workers, we do house them in uh, co-working offices as well. So this is more of like a flexible um, basis. So in this climate, what happens is that, you know, because co-working spaces are more flexible, uh, it, uh, as a result, you get a bit of benefit behind it because like, you know, you can adjust your lease uh, as and when, like uh, whatever requirements that come out from COVID. So I think I'll just share a bit on the two um, the uh, the two major impact of COVID on portfolio. It's not just about the social distancing requirement. I think, as you know, in the news, uh, there's a lot of news about you know the whole negative oil uh, uh, price and everything, and definitely that affects like the whole cash situation of the business. So for real estate, I think cash cash preservation is key. So what we need to do is that when we, we look at our capex, right, uh, of, for, for real estate um, spending, we have to start, you know, evaluating, um, you know, which are really business critical and which are like, you know, safety related that has to go first. And then those that are more like employee, um, those that are more like nice to have activities, those will be prioritized last. So this is a lot of like, you know, portfolio planning, like in the next five years in terms of prioritization has to revisit just because of the whole cash situation. And then with COVID comes about that whole questioning of like ways of working. Like now we have to balance, you know, giving employees choice, whether they want to work from home or work from the office. And how do we, you know, right size portfolio to, to, to allow people to work however they wish uh, in the future? And when will be the right time to do so? So I think for my department and, and what we do in the planning side, there's a lot of, um, you know, testing scenarios where we are talking about, you know, why not we try out different scenarios in different uh, offices. So they, we call it like pilot sites. So what I know is that like, you know, for given like a regional portfolio, there are uh, countries that, you know, are, are, you know, further down the COVID timeline than other countries. So for those countries that like, for example, China, there, there's people going back to the office already. Or like when we look at Vietnam, it's not that affected compared to like countries like America's. So I think on this, it's like, you know, on countries that seemingly ready, ready to go into the new normal, what we will do is that, you know, we will try out things with them. We will like, for example, start uh, tweaking our office configuration or, or, you know, we will start doing surveys with them to see whether they will come back or not. So I think all this is going to be like a play by ear basis, but I think only time will tell on like what the new normal is. But I think I want to concur with like most of the, the people today that, you know, this COVID situation has definitely accelerated timelines of, you know, this industry shift uh, with regards to real estate, where, you know, last time remote working um, is not, you know, widely practiced in many companies. And now, you know, suddenly everybody seems to ad adopt this more. And then, you know, moving forward, 
you know, when you look at office configuration, it's no longer going to be uh, just a fair fixed cubicle and meeting room kind of configuration because nobody's going back to office to answer emails and sit in the cubicles. People are definitely going back to, you know, have more training sessions, have more like social interaction or have more like, um, you know, just, just like, uh, cafe style, uh, like for example, different offices have different configurations. For us, we have uh, gym, we have cafes. So I think um, for occupiers, like you just have to think about, you know, how can you make office attractive for people to want to go there? And, you know, at the same time, corporates do benefit from getting them to, you know, relate with their culture, getting the whole team spirit back. And I think this is a lot of con uh, the considerations that we are, we are thinking right now with regards to COVID. Lah. Yeah, so I think this is a bit on sharing on the CRE side. Thank you so much, uh, Karis. I think uh, this is very uh, informative uh, presentation that we can learn about how actually the corporate real estate side uh, thinks about uh, uh, this uh, pandemic and you know what other sort of you know, consider considerations that they are really thinking uh, to revamp uh, the office space and all these kind of uh, uh, in uh, uh, working environments. So that was very helpful. Uh, as I mentioned, Lucas Wang uh, should leave uh, soon. I like to ask Lucas uh, to um, give a final thought uh, for a couple of minutes before he leaves. Uh, especially, I like to ask him about um, what are the new employment opportunities uh, for real estate, you know, for his juniors and also uh, if there are any things that we can consider uh, for our real estate education um, at NUS. Lucas? Okay, so maybe I'll focus on the second theme that you have talked about, which is on the new skill sets required uh, moving forward. And this will be extremely relevant for, say, our undergraduates today, uh, probably having some concerns in terms of uh, what else do I actually need to learn, right, to survive in the workplace of the future. Um, so I guess, okay, uh, from some of these previous uh, uh, lectures, I think some questions that came up is, uh, should I learn coding? Uh, should I pick up skills in data analytics? Um, some questions, in fact, in terms of programming language, what programming language to learn, what software to pick up, right? So, so I think the it's, it's not specific to what particular uh, language or software, but I think the, the key is that when you're specializing in real estate already, um, the rest is about learning enough learning enough such that you have the end in mind whereby you know uh, you think about what this knowledge would help you in your core discipline which is where uh, when you go into your future workplace how will it help you in your work process how do you accelerate such that you are able to give work fast given that uh, as previously mentioned by all the uh, uh, previous speakers that changes are happening uh, at a at at a really fast rate today. So um, apart from that, maybe build soft skills, uh, have a global mindset, uh, maybe a bit difficult today to like say work overseas uh, like John, um, given the current situation, but try to get a lot more like a global exposure. And I guess uh, with this in mind, uh, you guys are safe uh, to, uh, to survive in the workplace for the next decade. Uh, thanks for the time and thanks for the invite. I really enjoyed myself here. Thank you so Over much, you. Lucas. We have the last uh, speaker uh, from this Young Alumni session, uh, Lo Yimin. Hello, uh, I'm Yimin. I actually just graduated last year from real estate and I'm currently an analyst at SC Capital Partners. So I'm with the Recap Opportunistic Fund series. So we invest in assets across uh, all different asset classes like office, retail, logistics, hospitality, and all across key growth markets in Asia, like China, Australia, Japan, Korea, and even Thailand. And my day-to-day -day work involves uh, investments and underwriting. So we look at new deals and see whether they fit into our strategy for the fund to bring in returns for our investors, as well as asset management for our existing assets and a little bit of portfolio management as well to look at our portfolio from the fund level and how it all stacks up in terms of our geographical exposure or even asset class sector exposure. So of course, during this COVID period, there's been a lot of work done for investor reporting because we need to answer to our investors and a lot of them are very concerned with how our assets have been performing amidst COVID. So I think it has been very important for us to actually keep regularly in touch with our investors. So we actually do every three weeks, we send them a report on a kind of a COVID update on how our assets are doing, especially for more affected asset classes like hospitality, retail, and even like the assets in China. So 
I think for today, because like a lot of our work has has shifted towards more of like asset management for our kind of assets that are more cri in crisis mode. So I can share a little bit more about my work experience as the COVID situation unfolded. Yeah, so when COVID first started in late 2019, I think many of us didn't think too much about it because so little was known about it, right? And I was still looking out for new opportunities and underwriting new deals in Asia, like in China, Hong Kong, and Singapore for our funds. But towards the first two months of 2020, the virus was actually gaining much more attention as it had spread very quickly around China. And a lot of our focus, as I mentioned, was shifted towards asset management and protecting the value of our existing assets. And our local teams were also monitoring the situation very closely, especially for our assets in China. But of course, with so much uncertainty around the whole coronavirus situation, a lot of work that we were doing at that point was to prepare our assets in the event of an escalating spread of the virus. So in particular, assets that were more reliant on the tourism or travel industry was a cause of concern, especially with new travel restrictions and border controls that were implemented. So for example, our hospitality assets that tend to be more sensitive towards such travel sentiments, especially for resort style or leisure hotels in Asia, and where Chinese tourists were actually one of the largest source markets for our assets in Thailand and the Maldives, this highlighted potential problems that we would face if the pandemic had worsened. So I was actually involved in a lot of discussion on how we can reposition our asset and come up with new marketing strategies to attract other markets such as like the Middle East tourists, US, tour US markets and even like European consumers. But when this happened, it was still one to two months before the whole situation had worsened and spread all over the world and even in Singapore. So I remember it was during the Chinese New Year period where we had like the first few cases but many of us would never expect would never have expected how widely and quickly this virus would spread into a pandemic pushing governments all over the world to implement very very strict containment policies and lockdowns so in about march and april when this lockdowns actually started begin to begin across many economies everything changed so at that point we were no longer anticipating a dip in demand but rather we kind of shifted to crisis mode. We had to manage for a zero occupancy, zero demand environment. And because before the lockdown, many of the activities, even amidst COVID, were still ongoing and a lot of the activities could still rely on domestic demand. So like in terms of Singapore, people were still going to work on a daily basis. Retail malls were still packed because people had to continue with their daily lives and with the exception of cross-border travel. But with a lockdown, the world kind of slowed down for a moment. Everyone started to remain home and only essential services continued to operate at minimal capacity. So this actually hit many of many real estate owners on many fronts, including our fund. So for example, our development projects, they were halted as you know workers had to stay home and the process of government get obtaining regulatory approvals such as you know construction permits, land use right approvals were also delayed because the government agencies were physically closed. Um, on the roads, they were all empty and many of our assets were affected as with, you know, with the people staying home and they're not no longer visiting malls, they're no longer going to work. And this affected the businesses of our tenants. But in my mind, the two sectors that were most badly hit was retail and hospitality. So for retail malls, they were actually virtually empty as F&B establishments were shut as, you know, a lot of economies were banning social gatherings and retail shops were also forced to close because they were deemed as non-essential. And many of the purchases have shifted online towards e-commerce. But I think today I can share a little bit more about my experience with managing hospitality assets amidst such tough times, because I think uh, I've been pretty involved with some of our resorts in the Maldives and other hotels that we own um, in Thailand, Phuket. And actually because the nature of hospitality assets, they are slightly different from other com conventional commercial real estate assets where 
the real estate owners tend to take on the role, at, role of a landlord. Whereas for operating assets such as hospitality, we are not the landlord, but we are the owner and the operator. So our profits and returns were actually tied very intricately to the operations of these hotels. So our asset management, we had to be more involved in what was happening on the ground, how to bring in more customers, bring, in, bring up the occupancy and how to manage our escalating costs. So hospitality assets were beaten up even before the lockdown began, when global travel had fallen significantly in early 2020, and many trips have started to be delayed or cancelled. So in February and early March, our hotels actually started to receive quite a few waves of cancellations for our bookings on the books for the next six months. And I think our local managers were actually focused, uh, were very actively monitoring travel restrictions and border controls implemented by the local authorities of where our hotel was situated, as well as the key source markets where our visitors came from, because this would determine whether our visitors could actually come to our resort, our hotel or not. So in March, the COVID-19 situation had worsened so much that our hotels were actually seeing single digit occupancy on our books for the next three months. So about the second quarter of 2020, and there was very little pickups of new bookings for the rest of the year. And this actually meant that even if we decided to continue the operations of our hotels over the next few months, we will actually be burning cash just by keeping it open. So I think I've been in a lot of conversations similar to other hotels around the world on whether to keep our hotel open or shut because we had to consider the possibility of shutting down our hotels to tight through the next few months. So to reserve cash, which was actually mentioned by Carice previously that cash preservation is the most important in times of crisis. So I think there's no right answer or solution for all hotels, but it really depends on the location of the hotel and the market segment that the hotel operates in. So for instance, in our Maldives assets, it was announced in March that they would stop issuing visas for international tourists on arrival. So Maldives is well known for its beautiful lagoons and beaches, and it's a choice destination for vacation or honeymooners. But it isn't a place where you expect a lot of business travelers as compared to like metropolitan cities such as Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, where they enjoy both business and leisure travelers. So actually their demand tend to be less cyclical in nature. That's why for our Maldives assets, considering that there was no domestic market to rely on for tourism and uh, the borders were actually close to international visitors, this meant that we had no business for the next few months, which actually motivated uh, us to make the conscious decision to scale down our operations for the resort. But I think this might not be the case for all hotels. So for instance, in Singapore, the hotels were in a much better position as the government had booked over 7,500 rooms as dedicated quarantine facilities for Singaporean residents that were coming home from abroad. And even with Malaysia closing their borders before Singapore circuit breaker, many room nights were actually taken by you know, overseas workers that worked in Singapore but could no longer travel home on a daily basis. So in this case, leaving the hotels open, like in Singapore, could help to cover any operating or running costs of the hotels, including payroll, utilities, and other fixed costs. But at the end of the day, I think whether or not uh, hotel owners decide to shut down their hotels, all hotels are in crisis mode at this point, and many of the hotel managers were actually shifting their strategy from revenue management to maximum cost reduction while protecting your assets. So even for Singapore hotels that experienced a bump up in occupancy, many of these nights were booked at largely reduced rates. For instance, I understand that some business hotels in Singapore in the central CBD could, before COVID, have an average daily rate of about $350 per night. But at this point, it's only achieving an ADR of probably $100 or less. So I think, of course, many hotel managers would have to look into every area where we can reduce costs. And this includes, you know, ideas such as partially shutting down some areas of the hotels, 
uh, terminating any unnecessary contracts and even going line by line on our profit and loss statement to see where we can reduce costs such as like getting a discount on your cable TV subscription because all these minor things add up. But unfortunately, I think for many hotel owners and operators, the payroll was still the largest fixed expense for hotel operations. And many operators had to actually find ways to reduce their payroll expenses, which is very tough in such times. So they could have explored, you know, um, reducing pay or mandatory leave for their staff, or even the unfortunate event of like reducing some of their staff on their payroll. I think another factor that some of the hospitality assets would consider is their financing because for most real estate assets, you usually have a debt component on it and to keep up with the debt, we pay regular interest payments. So for some of our assets, we actually look into discussing with our lenders on how we could actually um, reduce this cash outflow for interest payments in this period where you know our resorts are performing forming at very, very low occupancies or closed. So for instance, getting a reduction on interest rates or even interest deferment plans to help us better manage our cash flow. Because at this stage, a lot of hotels, if they are closed, they're running at 0% occupancy, which means no revenue is coming in, but cash continues to go out. So cash preservation, as mentioned earlier, is very, very important. So you know, the interest payment usually also forms a huge amount. So if we could actually defer that to a later time, like in 2021, where our resorts are expected to be reopened, that could really help with the cash flow and help hotels to kind of like survive because now they are really on like living month by month, especially for hotels that don't have a lot of cash at their bank. So during this downtime, I think our hotels, while they will remain shut and operated at low occupancies, we were still working hard so we had our staff actually took the chance to carry out some repair and maintenance works to ensure that our hotel would be in good condition when we welcome our guests back and we actually spent a lot of time to look at reforecasted performances and a lot of scenario testing to see when can we open our hotels if we are op if we open at this occupancy would it help to tide over our cash outflow or is it better to open earlier or later so a lot of this was taken into consideration when we decide to close or even reopen our hotels and on top of that, we had to, it's kind of like starting from zero again. So a lot of hotels, they are reopening, especially for new hotels that don't have a very established brand. They might be pushed back by one or two years. So they have to go through this ramp up phase where you start with low occupancy and then in one to two years, then you stabilize. So their timeline might be pushed backwards, which is not ideal for owners like us. But ultimately, I think, of course, we are looking forward to the reopening of hotels and as more economies start to open around the world and, you know, there's a gradual lifting of travel restrictions and more hotels are actually starting to open and begin to welcome their guests back. And a lot of uh, hotels in big markets are actually starting with domestic tourism first, like in China, in Thailand. But this has to be done very carefully because you don't want your asset to kind of become a breeding point for like COVID. So, and once uh, there are COVID cases in your hotel, the reputation is kind of, uh, kind of bad and people might stay away from it. So actually hotelers have to be very, very careful on how they open and ensure that they implement very stringent cleaning of common areas and rooms, how to reduce consumer touch points, such as self-check-in services, and also other safe initiatives to ensure that guests are comfortable to return to our hotels. So I think the same goes for a lot of our other asset classes that we manage, such as retail malls and offices. Uh, a lot of thought has been has gone into deciding how we can safely reopen our doors and welcome visitors as re economies restart. And I think it's encouraging that I feel like most people like myself are itching to travel again. So hopefully this would be a positive sign for economies around the world and everything could go back to normal, albeit slowly and carefully. Yeah, that's all from me. Back to Prof Lee. Thank you so much, Amy. And, uh, very interesting to hear about how important to consider this uh, cash flow uh, uh, consideration uh, for hospitality real estate industry. You know, I look forward to 
uh, going to Maldives after the things uh, come back to normal seriously. It's a good idea to uh, ask uh, the presenter, the speakers, uh, to answer the questions that were typed in the chat room. So the first question was to Karis uh, on the um, show's plan for the next six months. So would it be a uh, partial work from our uh, uh, partial work from home arrangement, or are there plans for employees return to office eventually? Karis? Okay, uh, thanks James for your question. So I think for, for mainly what we're going to do in the next six months will determine a lot or depend a lot on what the local government advice is. And in Singapore, that will be the case, like uh, it will be MOM that, that basically says, you know, like now, um, everybody has to work from home if the company allows or the job doesn't require you to go back to site. So that is like the default, like, you know, nobody has any much choice about that. So I think in the next six months globally, that will be our take where we will look at government's or, or state um, advice on what should be the, the ideal uh, situation. Should we work from home or office? And um, as because I think right now the, the thing that's on, on everyone's mind is the vaccine has not been found. And we don't want to, you know, allow people to go back to work seemingly based on our own judgment and then risk, you know, reversing this decision and go back to the previous phase. So I think on that, you know, we, we six months, we think, you know, when we're looking at reports and also uh, what, you know, local government globally have, have said, it's a bit too premature. So most likely everybody, you know, have like, and, and that again depends on the vaccine. So I think six months is still premature. Maybe next year would be a, a right timeline on people going back to work. And also um, on, you know, whether it's going to be partial work from home or, or, or whether it's going to be a choice basis. This is currently being developed or studied by Global HR on, I think because it requires a lot of uh, thinking uh, behind the scenes, especially HR related. How do you motivate, continue to motivate people if they work from home or like institute company culture, do you have like some sort of virtual community to tie people in so that they feel connected to, you know, what the company goal is, the vision is. So there's a lot of thinking and also like, you know, what kind of benefit we should bring, give people like, you know, ergonomic budget, how much we should give them. Uh, how do we motivate people if let's say in the future, I hate like giving cash is like preserved, right? Like bonus is not going to be affected. It's going to be affected. How do you motivate people without bonus? Like things like that, you have to, you know, think about before even coming out with a decision that, you know, people have the choice to work from home. And from a utilization perspective or office perspective, that's quite secondary, I think, because mm -hmm. all this, you know, uh, that is one part of it, but it's not going to be the, the entire part of it. So I hope this answers a bit of yeah, your, your question. Okay, good. Um, to Emin, uh, there was a question of how the hotel operation is going to be like uh, for the next six months, uh, you know, especially if there is a st uh, staycation demand uh, and also, you know, what will be the sort of situation in the long term. For Singapore hotels, uh, I'm not very familiar with the full scene because we don't operate Singapore hotels, but I've been, uh, I've been reading up about them and I think it's very hard for Singapore to purely rely on the domestic demand like staycations. As you mentioned, it's a staycation. If you are looking at other markets like, you know, Japan in China, when people travel, the domestic demand, they are still in a new city where they can actually, um, they can, ex they can, after they go into their hotel, it's just meant for them to sleep, right? And then in the day, they can still go exploring. Whereas Singapore is pretty small. So, um, the actually, I think there will be a shift if people want to do staycations, uh, hotels have to, might have to give more offerings like inside the hotel room, like for instance, like family staycation, they have family activities for kids, things like that. So they definitely need to tweak slightly how they sell these staycations or even like F&B vouchers because Singaporeans going to a hotel is, is that is nothing new to them, like the surrounding of the hotel, they are mm. very familiar. We already uh, covered a lot about the weaknesses in the Western markets uh, exposed by the pandemic. And we also talked about the uh, threats and uh, digital disruptions to real estate. So I think uh, the other two important uh, uh, topics that we did not really cover much is uh, if there are new employment opportunities uh, during this pandemic or after, uh, and also, you know, for our uh, students and for our faculty members, what will be the sort of new skills that's, uh, that we can teach uh, for our students uh, in the long run? Um, so starting with uh, uh, Jacob. I think definitely there'll still be demand for real estate and past the, there'll be op employment opportunities for real estate. 
I think the, the question is really in terms of which facade of real estate are we talking about. Do we expect a huge growth in uh, employment opportunities within, say, a badly affected space like hospitality within the next 12 months? Probably not. But do we expect like a more employment opportunities in, say, logistics space? In, say, maybe a co-working space whereby the focus is really on less permanent leases and more flexible kind of arrangement? I think yes. So I think on a whole, definitely there'll be demand for real estate graduate. I think it's really a question of which aspect of real estate we're we talking about. Uh, I tend to agree with Jacob. I think uh, uh, choosing the sectors is quite important uh, in terms of uh, moving forward. I, I would encourage everyone to really focus on you know uh, looking for opportunities that uh, that you know will be more permanent. Uh, you know, in the post-COVID world. So I, I would say uh, things like, you know, in the digital economy, so, you know, look out for, for new space uh, opportunities in like data center, you know, cell towers. And then the other very new trend that I think we are looking at is also life science. So life science real estate, lab spaces, I think that's the new in thing given uh, our recent, you know, brush with uh, the pandemic. Then, for new skill sets, I, I think uh, it's important for us. I mean, if we want to do uh, investments, I I believe it's important for us to you know, pick up others. Uh, it's slowly becoming the industry uh, underwriting standard. So so that is that is something that we should look at learning at undergrad level. Thank you. I think for corporate real estate side, there will be a lot of jobs with regard to like human performance kind of low so there'll be like community managers how do you ensure like uh how do you re redefine a workplace experience i think all these roles will come out due to this whole shift in um, what an office now functions as so that's one another thing is that it will be quite wise to go into uh, learn pick up more on like you know data related skills so because how uh, real estate will shift is that it will increasingly become more smart more autonomous so what you want to do is that, you know, really go and learn what are some of the, the, the disruptors happening in the industry and really get a good understanding on the basics of, let's say, like knowing um, SQL language or like AutoCAD or like, uh, uh, you know, data crunching. Uh, you know, try to work smart at the end of the day and you as, you know, a young real estate professional, most likely you are the one going to, you know, do all these changes because of all these new perspectives. So I think really go ahead and understand what is required and, and upskill yourself is the most crucial. Yeah. And there was actually a question to Enin specifically, what will be the um, skill sets uh, that are needed for the uh, uh, analyst, analyst job? And then especially, uh, you know, whether we have to uh, learn any new software. So Enin? Okay, I think for the first question on like new skill sets, actually, I think it's very important to have soft skills. So what I learned because of like this COVID-19 and a lot of things have shifted because everyone is working from home, right? So a lot of our meetings have shifted online. So, you know, as like a junior staff, I think it's very important to learn how to commu communicate effectively and even on a screen. Uh, because for people like us, if you are in a, for like myself, when you're in a meeting with like many directors and people that are more senior than you, it can become quite easy to become forgotten in the meetings when they can't physically see you. So I think it's important to still speak up, like, you know, even if you are a bit shy, you have to take some courage and initiative to, you know, share your views with others in the meetings so to make your presence felt i think and it's also a very good opportunity for you to learn and you know get exposure i think actually usually as an analyst it really depends on what kind of like uh company you go to so because my role is pretty broad so like uh, I have, uh, it's a very good environment to learn because we are involved, I'm involved in like almost anything. So like we have like a creator to grave policy uh, kind of like strategy. So if I help underwrite a deal for investment, I'll help to asset manage and do the disposition. So it's quite interesting, but I think ultimately at the end, actually Excel skills are very, very important. I think, yeah, like what uh, previous speakers have mentioned, like, you know, some skills like others can be very useful, but I think if you don't know it, you don't need to worry. Like you can always pick it up on the job. 
but the fundamentals of you know excel like and being comfortable with like modeling or even it's not just about models but we on a day-to-day -day -day basis we look a lot at like p l so understanding financial statements uh actually reading them and also even like normal data analytics because like for my portfolio management role i look at projects across different asset uh like 20, 30 different deals in like two or three different funds. So how do you categorize them? How do you classify them? How do you manage them? And at the end of the day, learning how to present and, you know, process this information for your viewers, like your bosses to understand what you have been through so that you kind of like learn. I think it's very important. What I learned is that you help people do the work. So when you have deliverables, you do all the thinking for them. So when they see it, it's very, very simple. So I actually did all the thinking, like spent 10 minutes, how would they perceive this? And when you uh, produce a piece of work, it should be very simple, bite-sized, easy to understand, and the top flow is there. So yeah, that's what I experienced so far. And yeah, I think just always be prepared to learn and have an open mindset. That's the most important. Sounds good. Well, I mean, you know, these are very helpful advice for our uh, students because uh, these are the young alumni and you know, who graduated in like uh, uh, several years ago. So they were like your uh, students like you and now they have a very successful career in the real estate industry and, you know, it's very happy to see how they have advanced their career uh, and also uh, that, you know, very uh, thankful, thankful for them to share their experience with the COVID-19 situations, uh, how they, uh, what are the challenges and, you know, how they cope with this uh, from the various perspective, you know, from investment, fund management, uh, corporate real estate and asset management. So we learned a lot today from the speakers um, and also hopefully, uh, you know, the, the students have a little bit, uh, had a sense what they have to prepare to go to this various industry and you know how um you know they uh have to uh, prepare with this you know open mindset you know all these kind of soft uh, soft uh, skills uh you know in addition to the physical skills and um with that uh i uh thank everybody uh to participate in the session especially speakers thank you so much and i uh, hope uh, everybody stay safe and healthy mm -hmm.